All right, Black Ice TV in the house once again. Dr. R Renoko, Rashidi Renoko, yeah. Here with my friend Terry Riggs, HKTH, Knowledge and Travels. Take it away, my brother. Hello, everyone. This is Terry Riggs, the UK tour guide to the rest of the world. And we've got someone very special today. Which, we, as we have said today, his name is Dr. Renarko Rashidi. And at the end of the day, this is a guy that we need to respect and understand that he has got information and toured around the world and given us a loads of information. Dr. Rashidi, how are you? I'm great. I've had a wonderful stay in the UK. I've yeah. learned a lot, including a lot from you today, especially in the... Victoria and Albert Museum, so I'm in good spirits. Okay. You know, since you've been doing your um, the events from last week, Wednesday, and you talked about Dr. Ben, mm -hmm. just give us a little quick preview on just the two um, events that you've done so far. And what well, you've actually, I've it. done three lectures. Okay. And then I did the museum tour. Now, we started off Wednesday night with a, an overview of the life and works of Joseph Ben Yakinen, who we call Dr. Ben. Okay. He just passed away about two months ago, and he lived a full life, but he's mourned. He was a pioneer in Egyptology and also the African background to major Western religion. Mm -hmm. And then a trip to Cambridge, to the Fitzwilliam Museum, wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. And then a lecture in Birmingham, where I launched my new book, Uncovering the African Past, the Ivan Van Sertima Papers. And then it was back in Brixton on Friday night to do a lecture on the life and works of Dr. Ivan Van Sertima. Today, the tour of the Egyptian collection, for the most part, at the British Museum. And then tonight, I'll be doing a presentation on the uh, role of distinguished African women in ancient times. So it's been a good experience, a short experience. I've learned a lot. I'm grateful to you for what you exposed me to, but it's been a good experience so far. Okay, so let's just put it away to the public. Um, what's put you into this field of um, history? Oh, black people need to know their history. <laughs> Africans need to know the great things we've done. We know about slavery a little bit. Yeah. We don't know about resistance to enslavement. Mm -hmm. We don't know so much about resistance to colonization, but we need to know the whole story, okay. particularly the great things we've done in order to inspire our people. What I say is what you do for yourself depends on what you think of yourself. And what you think of yourself depends on what you know of yourself, and what you know of yourself depends on what you have been told. And for the most part, we've told we haven't done anything. Yeah. And so we need to destroy that mythology to give our people a foundation to move forward and an inspiration to, ins uh, something to inspire us to do great things. Okay. So let's say, for instance, if I had a whole heap of children and I'm doing them on a tour and I want to teach them something, how would I show them how to seek? I would tell them that uh, Africa is the birthplace of humanity and the birthplace of civilization. And so as African people, we have nothing to be ashamed of. Mm -hmm. And that we have a great future because we have a great past. Mm -hmm. And as long as you are aware of that, mm -hmm. then there's nothing, there's no goal that's too high for you to set for yourself and your children because you know that African people have done remarkable things and therefore are capable of doing remarkable things. Yeah, and then there was another thing um, I overheard yesterday about the, um, the, you knowing the Tookie Williams and, and the book. Did you get any recognition out of that book itself? We or? never published the book. You never published it? No, we never published the book. In fact, I still have the original manuscript. Okay. But another book, a related book called Redemption, was uh -huh. published, and Redemption tells it all. Mm -hmm. Because Tookie did some terrible things, Yeah. and he learned from that experience. He realized that he did those things because he didn't really know his true history. Mm -hmm. And so I mentioned in the book Redemption a number of times, and okay. I'm proud of Tookie. It's just a shame that he was not able to, based on, to me, the greatest irony in life is this. You're always learning, always getting information. Mm -hmm. And at the time in life where you have the most is just before you die. That seems very cruel to me, mm -hmm. yeah. because that, to me, should be when you just start. Mm -hmm. And Tookie was a prime example of that. Uh, Malcolm was a person, Malcolm X was a person who was able to, in a sense, redeem himself. Malcolm, at one phase of his life, was a common criminal, but he was able to learn about his true history, and he became our great black shining prince. Tookie never really had that opportunity. Okay, so let's say, and for instance, what would you say is your best book so far? 
Oh, man. Or which one do you enjoy? That you enjoyed actually writing? Maybe because it's the newest book. It's this one, Uncovering the African Past, the Ivan Van Sertima Papers. Yeah. If you had asked me six months ago, I would have said my book, African Star Over Asia, because early on I was recognized, rightly or wrongly, yeah. as the leading authority in the world on the African presence in Asia. And it's also my biggest book. Okay. I did a book with Ivan Van Sertima on that theme, and now a book on my own. But I think that this new book I'm very excited about, perhaps because it's new, but it deals with Kemet. There's a small section on Europe. There's a section on the African presence in pre-Columbian America. There's a significant section on the African presence in Asia. And of course, it's a tribute and uh, overview of the life of the great Ivan Van Sertima, who I work with very closely. Uh, and then I want to ask, you see, like, there's a, I've always asked this question, as, as an American, Right, and uh, as an African in America, uh, African, or mm -hmm. would they say an African American, or you say people, black people in America, how do you see any difference comparing to the black people that you see in Brit in England? Both of us are two confused groups of Africans. <laughs> <laughs> we are both the victims of white supremacy, mm -hmm. enslavement, colonization, and we reflect that mentally. Mm -hmm. Africans in America, or African Americans, I guess, have more resources than most other Africans. We have computers. Mm -hmm. None of us are hungry. Uh, we have tablets. We have access to libraries. What we don't have is the consciousness no. that we need to really make uh, use of the resources that we have. Oh. And Africans in Britain have almost as much, but not quite as much. Because I find out that a, a lot of events that I go to, even over here at this precise moment, I find that a lot of women are going and a lot of the men are not doing the same thing, mm. which it, I feel that it needs that push. But I don't know if that's like that in the States. It's like it in the States. And okay. there are you know, positive things that we can see in that. It's said if you educate a woman, you educate a nation. Mm -hmm. There are more black men in prison in the United States than in the universities. Mm -hmm. And it may be similar to that in the UK. Let's look at that for a moment. Yeah. Brothers who are incarcerated. Yeah. Brothers who are gay. Yeah. Which is not something I'm proud of, the effeminization of the black male. Mm -hmm. Brothers who are in, serving in the military. Mm -hmm. Brothers who are in poor health. Brothers who are hooked on drugs. Mm -hmm. Brothers who don't like black people. Mm -hmm. And so it's not unusual to come to a program where you see a lot more sisters than brothers, but for whatever reason, a lot of the programs that I give or lectures that I give, mm -hmm. a lot of brothers come, maybe because of the way I present or mm -hmm. circumstances. So like on what you're presenting today, can we have a little a small insight? Tonight's presentation is going to be on African, great African women in the ancient world. And that's something I'm very proud of. I'm a very proud strong, masculine black man. But I enjoy elevating black women. I think that they've been denigrated in history. And as a black man and a black historian, it gives me great pride to talk about the things that our sisters did. And I don't think that makes me less of a man. I think it makes me more of a man. And I think that the role of black women in history is just something that can't yeah, be denied. Been denied. Oh, so who would you say is like a, a mentor to you within the the, the women's black history itself? Well, that's a problem. <laughs> you know, I can talk about John Henry Clark, yeah. Dr. Ben, I can talk about Ivan Van Sertima, but there are very few black women that have that, have that kind of prominent mm -hmm. role as historians. Okay. And I haven't known that many. I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that we're trying to get in bed with these sisters <laughs> instead of encouraging them to fulfill their destiny as historians. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that we need to work on. And I just think, too, a lot of it has to do with the society in which we live, which is very sexist. Not only racist, yeah. but it's sexist. Yeah. It's anti-black people, and it's also anti-black anti women. And so as a result of that, we don't see black women in positions of prominence in the fields of history. Now, there are exceptions, mm -hmm. but very few historians. You have, for example, this sister that I like very much, uh, Joy Leary. Yeah. And she's doing work on the post-traumatic slave syndrome. You have a sister named Marimba Ani who is doing work, she has a book called Urugu. Of course, you have Francis Cress Welsing, but none of them are pure historians. And I think that that's something we need to rectify because I think our sisters are qualified to bring something special and unique to the field of history. Okay, what about, would I say, 
what kind of queen would you choose from the past that you said that was good to research? Oh, the sister that stands out more than any other is Amos Nefertari. Nefertari. You know, Amos Nefertari, okay. because there are many women with similar names, but she's a warrior queen, she's beloved, mm -hmm. a special set of prayers written for her that were in effect 4,000 years after her death. And also, she's little known. We know a little bit about Nefertiti. Mm -hmm. We know a lot more about Cleopatra the Seventh, although she needs to be looked at again. Yeah. But Amos Nefertari is definitely the woman that uh, I think we need much more focus on. She's a perfect role model. Okay. Uh, then, and there's another thing. You know when uh, there's a lot of research, and we find a lot of research, mm -hmm. and that you've kind of gone over the research and you found out it's wrong. Do you find problems of rec rectifying it, or would you rectify it on your own? Well, we have a duty yeah. to rectify it, and also, being wrong is not a terrible thing exactly. if you recognize that you're wrong. Yeah. Some of us take historical positions, and then we dig in our heels, and we, we refuse to change that position yeah. in spite of the facts that are presented to us. Okay. Now, two or three things I can point to, at least two, that where I know I've grown. One, I used to argue that the uh, Dalits or the black or the untouchables of India were black, that they were an ethnic group. I don't believe that anymore. I think that they are a social economic group, the majority of which, by the standards of race that we use in the West, would be considered black people. Right? That's mm -hmm. one. And the other thing, I wrote extensively in the early 1990s about the destruction, the extermination, and genocide of the Aboriginal people of Tasmania. I went to Austra Australia, and yeah. I went to Tasmania, and I met them. Okay. And they said, Renoko, well, here we are. And I found out that I was wrong, that in spite of all the material that I examined, and it was extensive, that material was inaccurate, that white seal hunters captured Tasmanian Aboriginal women and used them as sexual slaves, uh -huh. and children were born from those unions. And so the Aboriginal Tasmanians today are highly, I hate to use the word, highly mixed people, yeah. but they retain knowledge of their past, past yeah. and they are badly damaged people psychologically. They were the victims of what are called the stolen generations. Their children were taken from them. They really suffered. Mm -hmm. And so those are two things that I've grown from. But generally, you know, I try to avoid what I call cherry picking or advocacy. Mm -hmm. I think that a good scholar will take all the information available, try to immerse him or herself into the historical period in which you are studying, and then say these are the conclusions that I draw. An advocate will take a bit of information here and a bit of information there and say this is what happened and ignore everything else contrary to that. And I think that in our community in general we have more advocates and cherry pickers than real historians. And that's something I think we have to fight against. I don't want black people fabricating history any more than I want white people doing it. Exactly. I want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The historian that influenced me the most philosophically is Chancellor Williams. Yeah. And he used to say that the African historian must be on a relentless search for truth and must not tremble with fear when that truth is contrary to what we would prefer to believe. A lot of us want to ignore history mm -hmm. and create a vision of history that doesn't necessarily correspond to reality. And that's something I'm totally opposed to. Let's say from five years from now, what would you give me three words to give to the youth that that we have today. Know thyself. That nothing is more important than knowledge of self. The good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, how do you prepare for today and tomorrow if you don't know what happened yesterday? There's an African proverb that says, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. Mm -hmm. And in order to know where you're going, you need to know where you've been. And if you don't know where you're going, you're bound to lose direction. So okay. that would be the advice I would have. Thank you, Mr. Rashidi. Thank you, my brother. Nice talking to you. Appreciate you. you. And I hope we can do I more talks. I look forward to working with you. Definitely. I'm very impressed 100%. by what you have shown me today, and yeah. we need young scholars like yourself with an unrelenting uh, desire to show the truth of what African yeah. people did, and you exemplify that. Yeah. Thank you, my brother. Thank you very much. All right. This is Ice TV 7, Black Ice, always. This is UK Guide to the rest of the world. I'm speaking to you, and I love you. I want to give a shout out to Black Ice TV 7, um, a television network that I'm just becoming familiar with, but something that is much needed. It doesn't do us any good for me to have all the information if we don't have a media outlet from which to disseminate it. And it seems to me that Black Ice TV 7 personifies that. So big shout out.